Yeah, I, I will start to bridge the gap between the distinguished speakers and maybe somebody who will be late today joining us. So we have very peculiar circumstances that uh, inspired that we have very prominent speakers and guests. So we have historic game to play against Greece. So and Georgians are preoccupied with that. Yeah. So it's a competition that it's lost from the very beginning, yeah? But uh, against this background, so I'm really grateful to you that you joined us today. And we are delighted and honored one time more to have such a wonderful panel of speakers. Uh, you know, Frank Fukuyama is a distinguished professor of Free University, as Mr. Jensen is. And I welcome Roger Leeds, who is uh, on the panel today. Professors uh, that are not the first time here. Uh, for those who are uh, visiting uh, this establishment for the first time. This is uh, Kaha Bendukidis campus, which houses two universities, Free University of Tbilisi and Agricultural University of Georgia. Originally, this building was during Soviet times and post-Soviet times, the building of the Agricultural University, which later became part of the Knowledge Fund which was established by Gaha uh, Ben Dukiza to promote education in Georgia and uh, made the uh, biggest private investment in uh, tertiary education of our education um, uh, in Georgia. So we are quite successful. I will not be bragging. Others can speak about us. But uh, we are, so to say, on our way to, to evolve further and develop. And uh, one part of it is that we are open to the world and uh, different views and um, expertise, which is beyond these um, walls. And um, again, we are really glad and honored to have uh, such distinguished speakers today. The theme which is discussed is also very interesting for me. We are in the age of changing uh, perceptions, narrative, uh, worldviews, and so on. Uh, I'll not be spoiling so the... the uh, so the, the ideas that will be here uh, pronounced and we will be discussing um, freedom of speech in modern circumstances uh, in liberal democracies against the background of walkies and the trends that are dominant uh, on the, in the society and uh, on the campuses. So, floor is yours, gentlemen. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be back at Free University. This is an interesting moment uh, competing against the soccer match. Um, but, you know, <laughs> um, go Georgia. <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll finish in time so that everybody can actually see the match. Um, I think that uh, it's interesting talking about wokeism in a place like Georgia because uh, it's a very American phenomenon, and it doesn't really translate into the politics of uh, other countries all that easily. For example, in continental Europe, you see some you know, instances of this, but it's not really nearly as strong as it is in the United States. And it's, you know, it's also fairly strong in other English-speaking countries like Britain, Canada, Australia, and so forth. Why that, that distant, uh, difference exists is a little bit curious. But 
I think uh, it's useful to give a historical background about where wokeism uh, comes from. Uh, so woke is an African-American, you know, uh, phrase, and it really refers to the realization, you know, there's a narrative that existed in the United States after the civil rights movement that the United States was in a post-racial society, that we had uh, slavery, we had Jim Crow, we had segregation uh, up until the 1960s, but uh, African Americans had achieved equality at that point. And with the election of Obama in uh, 2008, there was a feeling that um, you know, the United States had overcome this really terrible history of racism. Uh, but many African Americans didn't believe that because they experienced racism in a lot of different forms. And to be woke meant to understand that we weren't in a post-racial society, that racism was still a problem, that if you were black in the United States, you could feel um, uh, you know, maybe subtler forms of prejudice than you know, the kind that was experienced during legal segregation, certainly during slavery, but it was still there and white people simply didn't acknowledge that uh, African Americans had to bear that burden of, you know, constantly being reminded of their blackness and second class status uh, and so forth. And this, I think, has everything to do with why this is not such a big phenomenon in Europe because this really comes out of America's racial history. The fact that, you know, we did have slavery, uh, you know, in Washington, D.C., where um, Roger and I taught for many years, uh, a black person could not actually walk in certain parts of Washington up until the early 1960s. Uh, and it means that that legacy, you know, is in the living memory of, you know, people certainly of our generation. Uh, and, you know, there's other kinds of racial prejudice that exists. There's ethnic, you know, consciousness in this part of the world, but it's really not quite the same thing as the American experience with race and the whole uh, legacy and history of slavery. Now, a couple of things happened to the left as a whole that I think are important contextual aspects of why wokeism has become widespread. Uh, because the nature of what it means to be on the left has changed very dramatically in the last 50 years in the United States and I think in Britain and you know other parts of Europe. In the 20th century, uh, of course, people on the left care about inequality and they want to, um, uh, they want to reduce the inequalities that exist in society. But in the 20th century, this was interpreted really in Marxist terms big inequality was class inequality. You had a bourgeoisie and a proletariat, workers and managers, uh, but you know, in most countries, the working class were all the same ethnicity as, I mean, they were part of the dominant ethnicity, it's just that they you know, grew up in different, you know, more impoverished circumstances because of the stratifications that existed because of the you know, basically European class system. Um, but, what it means to be a left-wing progressive began to shift really after the civil rights movement because uh, people began to interpret inequality not in these broad class terms but in terms of race, uh, ethnicity, and then subsequently gender, sexual identity, uh, and so forth. And so when we talk about identity politics, uh, people that are concerned with identity care about equality. They want to end marginalization. They want to make people equal, but they understand inequality in these much narrower categories having to do with race, ethnicity, gender, and so forth. Uh, and that characterizes a lot of left-wing politics uh, in many parts of the world. It's interesting, in Latin America, uh, I just gave a lecture in Mexico a couple of weeks ago, and there, uh, in most Latin American countries, they're actually stuck in the 20th century. So they still have Marxists. They still think that the big struggle is between workers and you know, employers or managers or whatnot. Uh, and identity politics in this American sense is only beginning to make some headway. 
largely because of the indigenous populations that live in places like Peru or Bolivia or Mexico. And so, for example, the constitution that Gabriel Boric, the left-wing president of Chile, um, proposed that was eventually voted down, had all of these groups singled out in the constitution you know, for special uh, treatment. But that's not typical in that region. That region still interprets things in pretty much 20th century you know, class terms. But it's really in the United States where you have this shift to think about inequality as belonging to these uh, separate identity groups. Now, the thing that um, has evolved in the United States, and this is why I think it's a really American phenomenon, is that um, the experience of African Americans was really very unique. Uh, very few groups around the world have actually suffered in, in a way that's quite comparable to the way that African Americans have. You, know, uh, you have, for example, ethnic conflict in the Middle East and in this part of the world, but no group was holding another group as slaves, you know, as chattel slaves uh, in those societies. But that's the, that was the experience in the Americas. You know, in Brazil, they didn't get rid of slavery until the 18, uh, 1870s. And so it was a particularly cruel and bad form of uh, oppression uh, that really lasted. You know, if you look at the history of the United States, uh, the country fights a civil war over the issue of slavery, and uh, the North wins. They abolish slavery in the 13th Amendment. They pass the 14th Amendment that says that all persons born uh, uh, in the territory of the United States are citizens of the United States, which for the first time makes black people, uh, gives them in theory the full rights of citizens. Uh, but that promise of the 14th Amendment was not fulfilled for another century because in order to get the southern states back in the Union in 1876, they basically had to cut a kind of dirty deal where the southern states were allowed to reinstitute uh, a racial hierarchy that made black people go to separate schools that didn't allow them to use the same bathrooms and the same public facilities as white people. And that's what persisted really uh, up until the 2000s. Now, what's happened in progressive politics is that model, that uniquely oppressive model of racial hierarchy uh, was then transferred to a whole bunch of subsequent groups. Um, and they fought for their equality uh, under the banner of civil rights. Uh, and the first group, you know, obviously that followed on uh, black people uh, were women. And so the feminist movement, you know, gets going in the 1960s and 70s, and it's understood in civil rights terms in the United States. Civil rights is deeply embedded in American consciousness because of our Bill of Rights. And, uh, you know, feminism was really seen as an attempt to uh, give equal rights, you know, guaranteed in the Constitution to, uh, to women. Same thing, and uh, by the way, the, the procedure by which this equality is achieved uh, is not done legislatively. Uh, in democratic theory, this should be a matter for the Congress. Congress passes civil rights bill. They did pass a civil rights bill eventually, but uh, the big breakthroughs were actually done through the courts because you could not get democratic legislatures in the South to end legal segregation. <coughs> and so what had to happen was the US Federal Supreme Court uh, declared uh, equal but separate but equal unconstitutional, that you could not educate black children in separate institutions under the 14th Amendment you know, and the US Constitution. So federal power was used to uh, end, that, uh, end that system. And ever since then, uh, it's actually courts rather than legislatures that have been you know, the kind of battering ram that has broken down these different kinds of barriers of uh, uh, inequality. Uh, so for example, gay marriage was not legalized legislatively, it was legalized through an act of the Supreme Court, much like, you know, Brown versus Board of Education had been used to uh, end legal segregation in, um, uh, in education. 
And I think that the consciousness of the injustice of slavery was really the inspiration for many of the subsequent social uh, justice movements. Uh, so that's kind of the historical you know, background of, uh, of wokeism. In the United States, uh, we went through obviously a period of big turmoil in the 1960s and 70s after the civil rights movement, after uh, feminism, but uh, it then became kind of quiescent for about a 20 year period in the 80s and 90s when student activism was not that great. Uh, people seemed to be worried about getting jobs and pursuing their careers. But that suddenly began to change in the 2010s. Uh, and there are several triggers for this. So one of them uh, was uh, a whole series of police brutality incidents and the killing of black people at the hands of white policemen. Uh, this didn't start with George Floyd in 2020. This, there's a whole series of incidents like that that stretched back through the second decade of the 20th century that began to mobilize people around this issue of police violence against uh, uh, African Americans. And the other big in, um, development in the 2010s was the Me Too movement. You know, the, um, uh, the revelations about the behavior of Harvey Weinstein, this, you know, this Hollywood producer, and the victimization of women uh, at his hands. And so there, was, uh, there were triggers you know, to this greater consciousness of social justice. Uh, and I think that uh, the pandemic actually played a big role because everybody was shut down uh, from March uh, 2020 uh, for the next year. And in the, con in the middle of this shutdown, you had the killing of George Floyd by a policeman in Minneapolis. And that triggered an enormous outpouring of uh, you know, protest all over the United States. So we remember this at Stanford. You know, My students were really mad at me uh, because they said, we don't have an, I run a master's program at Stanford. And that particular year, it's a very small program. We only have about 25 students a year. And we didn't have any black students in, our, in that particular cohort of students. And so my students got really upset and said, why are there no more African Americans you know, in, uh, in your class? And it really, having lived through the Vietnam period uh, in the late 1960s and early 70s, um, you know, it, it, it kind of reproduced a lot of the um, protest dynamics that we experienced back then. People are mad about police brutality, and so they turn against, students then turn against the nearest authority figure uh, to them, which is their school administrators. Uh, so we were not responsible for killing black people in Stanford University, but uh, you know the anger was kind of transferred to the you know the nearest authority figure. So that's kind of the general uh, background. But I think that when you get into issues of freedom of speech and cancel culture, you're you're looking at consequences of this general movement that then become, I think, very problematic because they begin to, you know, the, so nobody would, I don't think anybody here would question the need for equality across all of these different categories, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and so forth. You live in a liberal society and your first duty in a liberal society is to tolerate people that you know, are different from you and have different lifestyles uh, and so forth. Nobody would, would contest that. But the way that identity politics was interpreted by many people became, in a way, much more, uh, uh, you know, much sharper and more assertive uh, than simply saying that we ought to tolerate people that are, um, uh, that are different from us. And, uh, it, it melded with really, uh, you know, I hate to say, but French uh, post-modernism. Uh, There's a long history to this. I know these people very well because I actually studied with Jacques Derrida in Paris back in the 1970s. Uh, Michel Foucault I met when I was an undergraduate. Uh, and in that kind of postmodernist thought, 
uh, there were various innovations, for example, about the power of language. A lot of postmodernism is about uh, a reinterpretation of words and an understanding that, or the assertion that words actually mean power. Uh, and you think about something like political correctness. So what is political correctness? Political correctness is a hypersensitivity to the meaning of certain words so that you, you know, simply the expression of certain forms of speech is interpreted actually by some people as a form of violence. In fact, I, I, I had forgotten about this, but after George, George Floyd, there were um, uh, bumper stickers all over my neighborhood. So I live in Palo Alto. Eric and I both live in Palo Alto, California, which is one of the most liberal parts of the United States. And there are all these stickers saying uh, that silence is violence. In other words, if you do not speak up about George Floyd and condemn police violence, you are guilty of, of violence yourself, right? That's the meaning of silence is violence. And political correctness is essentially, you know, this hypersensitivity to the exact words that uh, you use to describe yourself. So for example, uh, you cannot refer to anybody as being disabled. Uh, that is a, evidence of what's called ableism, uh, which is the assertion that actually if you're born deaf or blind or with severe autism or some other condition like this, uh, if you are referred to as being disabled, your dignity is somehow being uh, impugned and simply using the word disabled is evidence of aggression uh, or, you know, I mean, literally people interpret this as violence uh, against that you know, that marginalized uh, category of people. And I guess the, <laughs> the thing that's hard to convey is how crazy some of this kind of identity politics becomes. I was telling our Georgian friends last night at dinner, for example, that uh, one of my friends, um, an Arab uh, vice president of uh, one of the major uh, NED institutes in Washington ha had a daughter who was born deaf, she couldn't hear. And uh, when she was a teenager, uh, so there's a big deaf community in Washington. Gallaudet University is like the premier school for uh, deaf people. But by the way, just using the word deaf is also something not completely acceptable you know, within that community because it does imply a disability. And more militant activists within the deaf community actually do not uh, want people to think that not being able to hear is any kind of disability at all. It's just a cultural uh, difference. And my friend had a cochlear implant, had his daughter get a teenager, and all of a sudden at age 18, she could hear again. And uh, he went on TV to talk about this with an activist from the deaf community who was absolutely furious at his family. And he, you know, he was accused of ableism uh, and oppressing deaf people because he wanted his daughter to hear. And so this is kind of an example of, you know, in my view, how a basically good idea gets extended to the point where it just doesn't make any sense uh, at all. You know, that um, you, you want, um, I mean, it's, it's really a question of dignity, right? That in a liberal society, you want to treat every individual uh, and respect their dignity and speak to them and, and deal with them, you know, uh, both personally and, and politically uh, as people, equal human beings that deserve equal amounts of dignity. But what that dignity you know, represents uh, has shifted over the years. And so it's not simply your basic human characteristics. You know, no human condition can be regarded as inferior to any other because that's an assault on their dignity. And therefore, if you are born with a very serious disability, uh, simply pointing that out becomes a, you know, very contentious and something that you can't really, uh, you can't really do. Uh, and this was, you know, 
extended to all sorts of different kinds of behaviors. Um, you know, women entered the workplace in enormous numbers beginning in the late 1960s. This created a lot of different interactions between men and women in workplaces and adjusting to this required, you know, a lot of sensitivity about the words that you use and the like. And so, you know, this becomes a major area of social, uh, social contention. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now uh, in this. The freedom of speech issue comes up. It, it's a little bit complicated because free speech uh, in legal terms in the United States is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, and the First Amendment compared to the free speech rights in other liberal democracies in the United States is very, very extensive. So a lot of speech, you can lie, you can you know, express hateful, you know, there, there's a lot of really awful stuff that you can say in the United States about other people that is protected by the US uh, First Amendment. And in fact, the First Amendment also protects the ability of subordinate organizations like universities, like clubs, like newspapers, publishers, they can restrict speech uh, on their you know, media platforms. So for example, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal have the right not to publish you know, material, political material that they uh, disagree with. And that's actually considered an exercise of freedom of speech. So when a university sets rules that um, restrict speech, strictly speaking, that's not a violation of the First Amendment because only the government can restrict, uh, is, is prohibited from restricting speech uh, in, um, uh, in the United States. Uh, and actually private organizations do have the right to shape you know, the speech of their, uh, of their members. So when people complain about the absence of free speech in universities in the United States, technically that is not a violation of the legal definition complaining about is really the social pressure not to say certain things um, that uh, offend other people. And universities actually are allowed to make up rules, their own rules that are more restrictive than the very unrestricted First Amendment uh, uh, in the United States. Now, where this has become a problem is in a fairly narrow category uh, of speech. So let's take something like transgender rights, right? The transgender movement has been the latest of, it's the latest marginalized group to try to um, insert itself under the banner of, you know, civil rights uh, that need to be actively protected. And uh, just as an example of how speech becomes um, controversial in these circumstances, uh, a lot of transgender activists um, believe that there is no connection between biological sex and gender. Uh, and in fact, there have been uh, instances where a professor will write, has written uh, an article saying that there is a connection between sex and gender. I mean, it's not a moral necessity that if you're born a certain biological sex, you have to be treated that way. But you know, this particular pref uh, professor was um, simply arguing that you know there's kind of good reason why people born with a X chromosome behave differently from people without that chromosome. And you know, she lost her job over this at the university because of an interpretation of speech uh, that basically said that um, you know discrimination against transgender people includes creating a hostile environment, and a hostile environment is created by a professor that publishes an article in an academic journal saying there's a connection between uh, gender and uh, biological sex, right? And so this is a case where you have two rights that have come into conflict. Uh, the asserted right of transgender people to be treated equally and the right of people to say whatever they want at a university. And I think this is the kind of the cutting edge of these, these conflicts. There's, there's other liberal rights that have 
you know, the, the Me Too movement produced a lot of accusations of sexual assault against a lot of men. And the way that, uh, you know, the procedural rights that were outlined actually by the government uh, were not very protective of the rights of the accused, you know, in many of these circumstances. So it's not freedom, just freedom of speech, but other liberal rights that came into conflict with the interpretation of the rights of, you know, these different um, marginalized groups. And I think that when we talk about cancel culture or the lack of freedom of speech on university campuses, that's what we're talking about. It's actually technically not a violation of free speech, but it is uh, universities trying to make, um, you know, what in the view of many people are excessively restrictive rules about what can be said. And I, I guess I'll just end with this. In my view, the, the biggest controversy over these kinds of issues is really how big a problem this is. Uh, because in the United States, you can basically say anything you want to about anything. You know, given the, the First Amendment, uh, uh, we have a colleague, Daphne Keller, she's a, a lawyer that deals a lot with internet freedom of speech issues, and she points out that there's this big category of speech that is uh, what she calls lawful but awful. You know, it's hate speech, it's disinformation, it's, you know, terrible, vile things that people say to each other, all of which is protected uh, under, uh, under America's uh, First Amendment. And, you know, there's a real question that, so the internet platforms have been restricting this kind of lawful but awful content. And right now, there is uh, a bunch of conservatives that then take this and say, uh, see, the government is pushing the platforms to restrict freedom of speech. They're therefore censoring uh, conservatives by asking uh, the platforms to take down misinformation about vaccines or about whether the election in 2020 uh, uh, was stolen. Uh, and I think that there's a definite conservative, you know, so the identity politics on the left really gets people on the right upset. Uh, and so there are a lot of white men who, white straight men who think that they're actually the most persecuted category, identity category in the United States at the present moment because of this kind of political correctness coming out of the left. Uh, and they have gone to town with this. They, you know, there's a big uh, conservative media ecosystem that takes every kind of outrageous uh, instance of identity politics on the left, and then, you know, it goes into Fox News and it goes into the, uh, you know, ecosystem of right-wing uh, influencers and uh, all of a sudden becomes a kind of national issue. And the question is, there's no question that this kind of behavior exists <clears throat> in progressive places and in universities. Uh, I would say a couple things about that, that first of all, um, it only applies to a very narrow range of speech that has to do with identity politics. So uh, you have to be careful what you say about race, about ethnicity, about gender, about sexual orientation. There's no question that is uh, true. I would hesitate, you know, saying certain things that I believe to be true uh, on the Stanford <coughs> campus because this would generate, I mean, I'd have a whole bunch of students, you know, at my door the next day uh, protesting that, and you know, that is a restriction on my ability to speak, but it's only at Stanford University. And if I want to say it on Fox News, or I want to go out to, you know, a town, uh, you know, 25 miles outside of Palo Alto, there are many people that would be very happy to hear me, you know, say those sorts of things. Um, and so it's really uh, a restriction, private restrictions on speech on a narrow range of issues. You can say anything you want about Joe Biden or about Donald Trump, you know, uh, even at Stanford, you know, you can, you can still, <laughs> you know, talk positively about Donald Trump if you want. You'll be, you'll face a lot of social criticism, but, you know, you can still do it. And there are many other precincts in the United States where you can say anything you want. So if you think about regimes that really do restrict freedom of speech, we've got a ton of freedom of speech in the United States, but it's a fairly narrow category 
of things that are restricted by certain private uh, institutions. And I guess the big argument that I have both with people on the left and people on the right, people on the right would say, there's no freedom of speech left in the United States. And I think that's just a crazy, that's just a crazy assertion. Um, but there are also people on the left, uh, friends of mine on the left that would say, what are you talking about? You know, there's political correctness, not an issue. That's not important in the United States. Uh, you know, there's really no cancel culture and so forth. And that's also not correct because there are definitely things that you have to be very careful saying if you're in a university environment, if you're in Hollywood, if you're in a big media organization, you know, like the New York Times, uh, you do have to be careful. And so I think that's kind of where, in my view, the controversy is. But let's go on to Eric. <laughs> okay. What? This, okay. What, uh, what Frank just laid out was a historical context for uh, wokeism that most people in America don't know about. And it's an, a very important history and grew out of tons of justifiable uh, complaints from African Americans. Uh, now, wokeism in the modern vernacular is really associated with extreme cancel culture. Um, and uh, like I say, most Americans are totally unaware of the historical evolution of, uh, of the word. Um, the, uh, I, I, last night, we, we did a public lecture of sorts, and uh, someone came up to me afterward and said, my, uh, my son has been uh, waitlisted at, at, at Harvard, but I'm concerned about wokeism. And I said, she, he's, she, she said, what do you think? I said, just as Frank said, there's tons of free spe speech in America. Um, and even on college campuses, I, I, I would say it's a, it's a sure media winner to emphasize uh, wokeism. So it's, I, I would say it's disproportionately uh, covered in, in the elite uh, press. I, I told this woman last night, I said, you know, I, if he gets admitted to Harvard, it's the greatest opportunity of a lifetime. And if your reason for not sending him there isn't financial, and it's just concern for wokeism, I said, you're crazy. <laughs> um, so I, I predict that we're kind of at the high watermark of uh, uh, extreme cancel culture. Um, there, there's a, quite a long history, Frank, eloquently laid out a, a, a lot of it. But there's, there have been concerns about, uh, about closing perspectives in the American mind. Frank has uh, uh, one of his professors at Cornell back in 1987, uh, Alan Bloom, wrote a book, uh, The Closing of the American Mind. Uh, and he was criticized for it. I thought it was a good book. And uh, uh, John Haidt recently in 2018 wrote a book, Coddling of the... Coddling. American. Coddling of the American mind. So there's there's a uh, uh, there's a history of concern about about this. I think there there is some truth to uh, students being somewhat coddled at, at elite uh, universities. I wouldn't I uh, wouldn't deny that. But I think it's it's overblown. Why do I say it's it's a high water mark? I see these social movements as uh, swinging on a on a on a pendulum. Um, I'm going to uh, give the example of something that happened at Stanford Law School last year and what's happened in the aftermath. So um, a really, the Federalist Society, which is an incubator for far right-wing judges uh, in America, uh, is a student organization at Stanford and it is at uh, a number of law schools. Um, and the Federal, Federalist Society invited um, a uh, federal judge by the name of Kyle Duncan to the, to the law school uh, to speak. And uh, Kyle Duncan uh, is virulently uh, anti-gay, virulently uh, against uh, same-sex marriage, uh, and yet he's a, a, a federal judge. I, I would say that he does not have the temperament to be a, a federal judge. He's a, a, a Trump appointee. And by the way, uh, there are a number of uh, good judges who are appointed by Trump, but Kyle Duncan is not one of them. 
At any rate, he, uh, uh, he was um, invited to speak by the Federalist Society. He came, he started to speak, and uh, a number of students had walked into the, the uh, room where he was speaking and uh, started heckling him and wouldn't allow him to continue speaking. Um, and uh, the then uh, Dean of uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion unhelpfully inserted herself and had a five-minute prepared speech about how hurtful uh, uh, Judge Duncan's uh, opinions had been uh, to uh, Stanford Law students. Um, and uh, Judge Duncan wasn't allowed to continue to speak. So um, this was uh, a major media event with Fox News, Wall Street Journal. It was all over uh, Washington Post, New York Times. Uh, it was all over the, uh, the, the, the press. Um, and uh, you know, the next, uh, immediately, I think even that day, the president of Stanford University and the dean of the law school uh, sent a letter to uh, Judge Duncan um, apologizing for the uh, behavior of the behavior of the students. Um, and uh, it, the behavior of the students was strictly against uh, Stanford uh, uh, policy, uh, which uh, uh, says that students are not allowed to uh, prevent carrying out uh, public events by heckling or other interruptions. Uh, and Stanford staff uh, failed to uh, uh, to carry out the, the, the policy. Uh, a couple weeks later, uh, the dean of Stanford Law School uh, wrote a 10-page uh, letter to the uh, student body and uh, outlined uh, her ideas on uh, freedom of speech and how this conduct was, was unacceptable in the, the law school. After all, especially in the law school, we're, we're uh, used to taking positions, uh, opposite positions, and arguing those positions. That's, that's what we do. Um, and her 10-page uh, letter became a, a cause celeb. Um, and I think this particular dean was, was m more sympathetic to um, not cancel culture, but more, uh, she was definitely uh, in favor of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a strong proponent of it. But I, thought, I think she saw the limits of where uh, wokeism was going with extreme uh, cancel culture, and voted with her feet on the side of uh, freedom of speech. She was roundly criticized by a small group of uh, leftist law students at the, at the law school, uh, she taught a course, the, her constitutional law course, the next day, and uh, when she walked out of the classroom, there were students dressed in black, including black masks, uh, that uh, uh, formed an aisle uh, for her to walk through, sort of an aisle of shame, uh, for uh, having written uh, this uh, letter. Um, I think this was a real wake-up call for Stanford. Uh, and a real wake-up call for students. Uh, some students uh, wrote uh, op-eds in the Washington Post and elsewhere said, we aren't all nuts. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, and, and the, uh, the environment at, at uh, the law school now, I would say, is, is to, to, uh, to understate it, uh, much, much more tempered uh, today than it uh, was after that outburst. And that's why I, I, I think with all of the media attention on a, a extreme cancel culture uh, and incidents like this, I think uh, really um, move everyone to a, a more reasonable uh, uh, equilibrium. Frank and I have signed a, a, a um, Chicago, uh, University of Chicago statement on uh, the uh, academic freedom. And it's, it's pretty uncompromising. Uh, and I, I signed it happily. Stanford issued one that I thought was a little watered down. I didn't sign that. But um, the, uh, I think the academy has, has moved uh, uh, and has been awakened by events such as the one that happened at, uh, at, at the law school. There's uh, the, the law dean at, at Berkeley uh, uh, Law, uh, Erwin uh, uh, Cherminsky, um, is a First Amendment uh, scholar. And uh, he's written about uh, Heckler's veto. And uh, he said, uh, free speech does not protect a right to shout down uh, others uh, that cannot be heard. And I think that 
um, we're, that's from the Dean of Berkeley uh, uh, Law School, and we're going to see a lot more of that, I, I think, uh, across the country. I'm going to be very brief because I want to hear from you, the students at the Free University. Um, the university is supposed to be is the ideal for free exchange of ideas, and I think the examples that we've just heard are examples of intolerance on the university campus, which has gotten much, much worse in the last few years, and that's what wokeism is all about, on both the right and the left. And so when you have this level of heightened intolerance, you have a problem, and we have a big problem. And you know, I'm not sure I am quite as optimistic as my friend and colleague, Eric, that it's reached its height. But we have incidents all over the United States on university campuses of people not being allowed to speak for one reason or another because of their views, which many of us do not agree with. But to not allow free speech on the campus is, I think, a, you know, an extreme violation um, of tolerance, and we're seeing it a lot in the United States. So it, it's manifested, of course, politically in the polarization that has characterized politics in the United States. It's, polarization is an example of intolerance on both the right and the left. The only other thing I would mention, uh, Eric, you made brief mention of it, is that it's not only speech. Uh, we have sort of institutionalized this through what we call DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so now many institutions, and in particular universities, this diversity, equity, and inclusion has been incorporated into the hiring of faculty and the admission of students and the promotion of faculty to a higher level so that now, unlike anything we've seen in the past, this has become almost an ideological rigidity within institutions, in universities and other, other private institutions. And so it becomes a criteria for how you advance. So we've replaced meritocracy, which was one of the hallmarks of universities in the past and other institutions, with what's called DEI. And so now, unless you subscribe to and can, can, can pass uh, the qualifications on the basis of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you, you cannot advance. And so this has become a, a huge impediment uh, to how universities work and how other institutions work. And someone, a, a former colleague of ours, wrote an article recently equating the DEI uh, standards and the institutionalization of DEI to authoritarian governments, uh, communist governments in particular, it, it, you, where you have a rigid set of criteria that have nothing to do with merit or qualifications that determine who gets promoted, who gets admitted, who gets advanced, and this has become a very, very big issue in the United States. It came to prominence recently when, when uh, the presidents of three universities came before Congress. But this is the other manifestation of what Frank was talking about, the intolerance uh, that has divided our country, and it also is the intolerance that is, uh, that is, uh, is manifested in, 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 in how we have replaced this so-called tribalism with meritocracy in, in many instances. And I think that has been a tremendous backlash uh, against this. Uh, so that, as Frank said, you being a white, a, a white male is a, is that has become a liability uh, in certain institutions if you want to get promoted, if you want to get admitted, if you want to advance. And I think this is another aspect of this. But we're dealing with it in, in America. It's, it's out in the public domain. Uh, it's hotly debated. Uh, it, it is an issue. It's just particularly an issue on, uh, on university campuses where, as I say, the ideal should be free exchange of ideas with no tolerance. Um, but I, I suspect we're probably making some, prog some progress. But we would, I think all three of us would like to hear what you think about this issue. If I could add a footnote um, that's critical to the argument that I was making about uh, the high watermark for uh, uh, extreme wokeism on college campuses. Um, the um, uh, uh, college, uh, elite college campuses are being uh, hit where it hurts in the pocketbook. Uh, 
uh, uh, donors have, and I don't really, I don't support donors trying to control uh, uh, speech on college campuses, but uh, uh, some very prominent donors at Harvard have uh, withdrawn their support. Uh, and uh, believe me, college administrators pay attention to the, the, the bottom line. So I think that is an economic feature that will uh, be pressing on uh, wokeism. Uh, also, I happen to know that you know, after the Stanford Law School uh, incident, uh, fundraising, which has never been a problem for the school, it still isn't a problem, but uh, uh, they were aware that there was a, a causal effect between funds being raised and uh, the event that happened at the law school. Yeah, so the floor is open if you have any questions or comments. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Tony. Uh, it's been a long time. Um, I haven't been here since my graduation. Can you speak up just a little? I haven't been here since my graduation. My name is Tony. Uh, I found the subject very interesting. Could you please share your observations about um, woke culture regarding um, ongoing conflict in uh, Middle East and um, how is it translated in this um, um, uh, conflict and uh, discussion? Yeah, that's a really tough one. <laughs> Uh, because that's really testing the boundaries of freedom of speech. Uh, um, I don't even know where to begin with this one. Uh, no, how's the Middle East conflict been affecting freedom of speech? I mean, uh, so there are definitely red lines that have been drawn in terms of what you could say either about the Palestinians or about Israel. And I think after October 7th, the Hamas attack, it turned out that um, many, there are many more left-wing students than people had realized, and they're all very, very pro-Palestinian. Uh, and that has actually led to some pretty shocking both assertions and acts of anti-Semitism of Jewish students being you know, isolated, uh, criticized, harassed, uh, and so forth. But it goes the other way as well, because there's also pushback against um, you know, a lot of these very pro-Palestinian, very radicalized uh, students. And so I think that there are definite red lines as to things that you can and cannot say that are either interpreted as you know, anti-Arab racist or anti-Semitic. And I think in general, what's unfortunate is that those lines have moved in a more permissive you know, direction, particularly with, you know, anti-Semitic comments and things that would have been just completely unacceptable, I think, 10, 20 years ago have been said, you know, and so the, that taboo has been, um, has been broken. This, as Frank said, this is a very, very complicated issue, but I think that uh, it has been somewhat or very much misrepresented <clears throat> in the press. So you, there are many students in, in, in the United States and around the world who are very pro-Palestinian. And there are many students around the world who are against the regime in Israel. That does not necessarily mean that people who are pro-Palestinian or against the Israeli government or anti-Semitic. And I think that one of the problems, at least in my view, is that when you mention that you're pro-Palestinian, you're immediately uh, branded as anti-Semitic, which I think is patently not true. And so we have to be very careful how we use our language in, in this case. And uh, so I think there are many students, for understandable reasons, who are in favor of the Palestinians, who are against the policy of the Israeli government, and they're not necessarily anti-Semitic. Some are, by the way, but not all. Um, thank you very much for your speech. I had this question about, you were talking about how uh, because of this uh, new direction about the restriction of freedom of speech and wokeism, a lot of students are now, um, uh, are now sharing the ideology of more rightist movements. So I had this question about, for example, Georgia and other countries where we can say that the civil rights movement were 
was not as prominent, nearly as prominent as, as in countries like US or Europe. And I was interested, so now we have a lot of questions that we have to draw attention to and speak about, and how can we do that without drawing a lot of um, people to the writer side, as we can see in a, in a lot of communities, and as well as in USA, that uh, a lot of ideas that uh, involve the uh, attention and talking about more of a, uh, let's say, claimed as leftist ideas and uh, defending minorities' identities are also uh, contested by the right movement, for polit politicians or channels. So how can we draw attention to those is issues without, um, without uh, let's say, uh, getting them um, getting them associated with like extra left side or without getting contestation from the right side? I mean, we face exactly that problem in the United States. I mean, because our politics is so po uh, polarized, if you say something that is a reasonable version of something that Donald Trump has said, you're going to get attacked as being a Trumpist. You know, so for example, um, I think that actually there is a really big problem uh, with our inability to control our southern border. Uh, but if you, you know, express support for stricter controls on the border, you're going to be attacked mercilessly from the left as being, you know, a Donald Trump supporter. Uh, and it means that people are afraid to actually express opinions about things they believe in uh, because they don't want to be labeled, you know, in that uh, manner. Similarly, there are things that you can uh, say about, you know, on, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, where you're criticizing, um, you're, you're actually um, doing something that will be criticized by people on the, uh, well, it, 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 it works both ways. So, so I, I talked about this pendulum swinging back and forth. And uh, staking out extreme views has its, uh, uh, has its consequences. I'm all for gradualism. I understand social movements and, and, and this sort of thing. But um, a famous historian years ago wrote about blowback. And I would even argue that Obama's election, which many of us celebrated, we're, we're experiencing some of the blowback from that in American politics uh, today. So uh, what seems like a victory uh, at, at one point in time may in historical evaluation be something less. But my only rather extremely modest advice is to you know, stake out reasonable uh, positions and pluck as many feathers with the least amount of hissing. We're conscious of the fact that you want to get to the game, so um, we don't want to overstay uh, our... Our goal here is to get you to the game on time. You made a very clear distinction that when we are talking about uh, restriction of freedom of expression in university, actually the First Amendment is not very relevant because there is no such uh, so-called state action, right? It's a, pri it's a matter of private individuals, but uh, is there any cause or tendencies to like increase state responsibility in this relationship? In this relationship, or it uh, would be it would cause some um, uh, problems in regard of academic freedom? Because, uh, for example, um, in some private relationships, for example, when we are talking about discrimination in the labor market, state has some kind of. Um, regulations uh, against anti-discrimination rights. So do you think that there are some kind of feasible um, uh, options in regard to protect freedom of expression from the state when we're talking about the private, univers private universities or it's on the contrary dangerous in regards to academic freedom and you are skeptical about uh, state uh, uh, involvement in this process? Thank you. So there's actually a case that was argued before the Supreme Court last week that dealt exactly with that issue. And actually Stanford University was one of the parties to this, you know, to this uh, uh, litigation. Um, so at the beginning of the Biden administration, uh, the Biden administration wanted to, they talked to the internet platforms, Google, Facebook, Twitter, 
uh, and tried to get them to take down bad information about vaccines and then all of the stuff that was circulating about the 2020 election being fraudulent. And in fact, you know, people on the right were doing things like posting wrong information in black neighborhoods about where people should go to vote so that they would basically be disenfranchised. And so uh, the administration, you know, talked to these platforms and uh, said, please don't amplify these kinds of bad messages. And this then provoked conservatives uh, to say this is government censorship. And the actual argument that was before the court was whether it was. Uh, I personally don't think so. And I think that actually a couple of the conservative justices uh, agree with that position that uh, there's, a, there's a delicate line between the government coercing the platforms, you know, saying we're going to go after you, uh, you know, uh, after your license or something like that if you don't take this down, and simply saying, you know, it would be nice if you consider taking down the stuff that's really toxic and, you know, bad. I think that's all they were doing. Uh, they weren't actually coercing anybody. But it is a kind of delicate issue because you can imagine circumstances in which the government would use its power as the government to really force these platforms to do things that they otherwise, you know, wouldn't do. And so that's, that's an issue that's being argued out right now you know, in the court as we speak. Some of, some of this has nothing to do with government or law. So I would give you the example. I talked a, bit in, a minute ago about DEI and policies within universities and policies within uh, companies, private companies, uh, where they are using these criteria other than merit for decision making about who gets in, who gets, who gets admitted, or who gets promoted, or who gets tenure, and so forth. This is done within the institution. It's not legal. It has no legal. No, not, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not correct. Well, it is in, in the universities. It has. It is. Uh, yeah, here. It, it's complicated because there is this Title IX in the Education Act of 1972 that has been used to set up DEI offices in every university. I mean, I, I could go on for the next half hour about the history of this thing, but it's not true that is that the government plays no role in uh, pushing universities towards. It's been way interpreted very broadly or very narrowly. And and just a, a footnote: it, it it isn't true that there the government doesn't have leverage even over Stanford and other uh, elite universities. Uh, elite universities get a lot of government funding. Um, in the billions of dollars. So uh, so there is some incentive to be compliant with Title IX requirements. Maybe, should we make this the last question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Fabrizio. I'm originally from Italy. So I'm not really like, uh, I don't know really much about Georgian culture in terms of like uh, speaking about wokeism and political liberalism. But in Italy, of course, we see a lot of like wokeism, this debate, I can see it like crawling in each and every day. My question is like linked to the function of the internet as a platform in this conversation. And the second part is, of course, today our conversation has been focused more on the controversial aspects of this phenomenon. Uh, but I'm thinking also about like how conversation is happening in other societies, like I don't know, Russia, China, India for how controversial is wokeism that you see in the US. If you take an eagle eye view from above, do you still see it as, as a symptom of a lively democratic debate? Should we collectively say, yes, it has problems, there's a lot of problems, but we can still say, okay, maybe it's better this than to have other kind of conversations. Sorry for having this double prong question, but yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, when you mention Russia and China, I, I, I'm just very, going to be very brief. There's so much disinformation coming out of Russia and China, and uh, extreme uh, cancel culture in the U.S. is just a really high-priority propaganda item. Um, 
and just a, a point about social media. I mean, years ago we had one of our colleagues started a program on liberation technology. This was back in the the um, uh, the dark ages when the internet was the capacities of the internet were just being realized, and uh, many of us thought that the technology would be used for uh, for good and on balance would be used for good. I think that that uh, initial uh, assessment is totally naive. Uh, the the uh, volume of uh, negative stuff that uh, influences human behavior on the internet is mind-boggling. Yeah, and I think as a result, the platforms really have to act like publishers and, and just not publish a lot of really, really awful stuff. Otherwise, the internet would be completely um, uh, unusable. The problem is, when it gets into political speech, they don't really have the legitimacy to make a judgment as to what is acceptable speech and not. And that's why I think we're stuck right now, because we don't want these private for-profit companies to make these decisions, but we don't want the government to make them either. And I mean, you know, that, that's the conundrum I think that everyone is facing at the present moment. Okay. We have one more. And one more. Who has the microphone? Oh, sorry. Do you ask friends or two more questions? Two more questions. All right, two more. <laughs> we have spoken about how straight white men feel like they are the most left out due to the wokeism that is happening currently in America. But I think that the minorities have been more influencing females rather than males. We have had a lot of instances where, first of all, mother has been changed to a birthing person, and also a lot of biological females have been addressed as cis women. So how do you think, where do you think the line should be drawn, where we try to coddle minority, but also do not disturb majority? Because in my personal opinion, it somehow affects not only freedom of speech, but rights, human rights of females. Why? Well, I would agree with you. I mean, I think it's ridiculous to talk about birthing persons uh, as opposed to mothers. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that that's, um, that's the problem with this kind of activism, identity activism. You start with a good idea. You know, you want to tolerate uh, transgender people, not uh, act in a prejudicial way against them, but this is extended to uh, forcing everybody to adopt a different language to talk about things that, you know, they're perfectly capable of talking about men and women, but, you know, they're not allowed to say it because it may give offense to some transgender activist. You know, I think that that is an illegitimate extension of, you know, identity politics, so. I'll just say that um, I've worked in and lived in countries uh, where uh, women aren't allowed in the workforce, aren't allowed out of their homes. Um, the the idea that, and a lot of my work is on economic development, the idea that countries can develop with uh, half the country liberated and half the country shackled is ridiculous. Okay. Um, thank you. I'll do something unusual. I'll speak on the behalf of the white straight men. I think the, the issue also would be, um, have you called it the it, identity activism? It's usually, it's you, you see only LGBT people standing out or mostly for the LGBT rights and questions on discussion like this. Uh, females who identify also like feminists and raise the question about uh, themselves because it's so easy to relate to a person that you are similar to and it's uh, harder to be in positions or shoes uh, of somebody else and we all try to emphasize to some extent and I think that's like I'm also trying to emphasize w w with the men who feel that uh, in these discussions that they um, somehow being punished for the things that they didn't do or don't have relations to. And when we do, for example, training on anti-harassment or admiration, my colleagues, like I had the discussion with the colleagues who felt so threatened or intimidated or accused that he didn't want to listen. 
because he wasn't accused. And it's actually had a contrary fact because he's not listening and I don't want to put him in a position, himself in a position because he feels that it attacks his identity, his, his um, personal interests and so on. Um, so while leveraging, and I'm in support, and I don't know if it's tolerant still to say it, but what we call still in Ukraine positive discrimination, when you give quotas and when you support these peoples who are historically discriminated, but how you build a dialogue in the way that those people who might be, who might receive or might be affected by this uh, in, in the negative way, that they don't feel that this policy is unjust over them. And they will feel because we all in the end individualist and it's quite unnatural for us to think in the sense of the society or the state that I think for the states it's definitely more beneficial that university has representation of different groups and it's more di diverse. But from perspective of the person who thinks that he didn't go out because of the marriage to Stanford University, uh, but because of others, they're becoming angry. And uh, if they don't have a platform, and, and this anger doesn't help us to build a dialogue. So I'm not telling that we shouldn't implement this policy. I'm trying to ask a question how we get out of this, because I think it's all the time it's more and more anger, anger and more and more conflicts uh, and this polarization and people just uniting among, among, instead of asking and talking about these hard questions, they united only among those who share their views. And Facebook is helping with that, with the with the algorithm that it's using. It starts showing you only the views that you like and you share, and it even gives us even further part of trying to understand the perspective of another person and trying to to build a dialogue about it. Uh, is there a question? Well, so how do we build this dialogue? Is that the way out? You can see heard about many problems today. You know that. I'll give this a shot, Irina. I'm not sure it's going to be satisfactory at all. We, uh, we have a, uh, a colleague at Stanford by the name of Jim Fishkin who uh, has uh, run experiments on expand, expanding civil discourse. And Frank, maybe you want to comment a, a, a little bit about that. As a white male in the life that I've led, I can hardly remotely consider myself victimized by anything. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. Good.